Here we go. So first off, let me introduce my co-presenter, and I'm making sure she's still here. I can't see her, but I'm assuming she's still here. Janine, do you want to say hello to everyone? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hello, everybody. My name is Janine Bullock, and I'm a Boating Facilities Program Manager at the State Marine Board. I've Great. been with the agency for a couple of decades, and um, I'm looking forward to uh, sharing some information and uh, hearing uh, from you as well. Thanks, Janine. Hi, everyone. My name is Kelly Perry. I'm the Lincoln County Parks Operations Supervisor. I am new to this position. I started last summer, and Lindley was one of the parks that um, I am managing now. And so as Janine and I will present the history of this park, I just kind of want to set up this meeting as in we're presenting what has happened in the last 10 years with this park, and we're looking for feedback at this current plan because plans have changed. And so I want everyone to know that we're not moving forward with this tomorrow. There will be many meetings when which you can have your public um, process and public comments. And I wanna make sure that everyone is being respectful at the end of our presentation as we open the dialogue up. Anything else you'd like to add, Janine? No, I think that's a, a great start. Great. So where are we, what are we doing? What are we talking about? Where is this park? So this park is on the Alsea River at mile marker 8.2. It is a 9.99 .9 acre parcel of land that is east of Walport. Here's a little picture, an aerial picture of Don Lindley. Um, it's got a cool location and that's this bend of the river right before the bridge comes in. And Janine, can you tell us a little bit about the history? Yeah, so around 2008, um, we started receiving um, calls from Lincoln County as well as ODFNW uh, identifying there was a need for boating access. And we went and looked at several different pieces of property with both the county and ODFNW and tried to narrow it down to a site that we felt was feasible for development. And it, as you can see from that timeline, it took several years to find property and um, find some that made sense to try to develop as a boating access point. Once this property was found, um, it was actually purchased and it was purchased through a series of different grants and um, some leases. So the property is actually owned by Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And the Port of Alsea has a uh, basically a submerged land ownership that is leased back to ODFNW. We provided grant funds to help purchase the property as well as. Um, I want to say they've changed their name now, but it was Oregon Heritage Wild or Oregon Wildlife Heritage also provided um, some significant funding to purchase the property um, for the intention of developing a boating access site for both motorized and non-motorized boats. And then once the property was purchased, the county and ODFNW entered into an agreement to operate and maintain the site, as well as pursue um, the permitting and design and the process to go through for the development of the access. Next slide, you're cool. Yes. All right. So in 2016, we developed a plan. Um, and when we approach design, we're looking at several things. We, our goal is to avoid wetlands, to um, have all of the archeological work done, uh, as well as hydraulic analysis. And we developed a concept. That concept was shared during a pre-permit process that also had members of the public and um, a county commissioner attend the meeting on site. And during that meeting, um, there was a lot of feedback from users that the size of the facility was undersized for the amount of use. 
and discussions were had with the permitting agencies that we could impact the wetland, but it would require some additional mitigation. So based on that feedback and discussions with the permit agencies, we modified the design and the design encroached upon the wetlands. It expanded parking, expanded the boat ramp. And through this, it wasn't just a boat ramp and parking. It also included a restroom and it included a mixed use dock that had a um, angling opportunity as well as non-motorized launching and um, a pick up and drop off area for folks as well. So this was the concept that we went to the pre-permit. So this is the concept A where we had a pre-permit meeting. And as you can see, we're avoiding the wetlands. Um, it's a smaller footprint. And it was based on um, that whole approach of this avoid it, let's do um, all of our due diligence with uh, archeological resources and hydraulic. Okay, go ahead and go to the next one, Kelly. So the next one was the expansion of, of the site development based on the input we had from users during that pre-permitting meeting and from the permitting agencies. And then during the permitting process, um, things have changed. This is, this is a project that's been around for a long time and conditions with the permitting processes have changed as well. So now we are going backwards a bit and reducing, we're avoiding, oh, and, and this image is to show you that footprint within the entire property. So the developed area is a small portion of the entire property. Um, then, so then this one is based on the uh, work with the permitting agencies and the changes that had happened over the years to where we need to avoid the wetlands. So we're avoiding the wetlands, um, We've expanded some single car parking to help uh, with use by paddlers and some day use. And the boat ramp is also smaller. And go ahead, Kelly. And then this would be that impact. Now, I do want to say that the survey information was from, I believe, 2019. And some of the um, site conditions could have changed. So. I do want to caveat that it's been a couple years, uh, and I, I know there was some tree maintenance completed by the county of some hazard trees, but that is, is the impact of the uh, design that would avoid the wetlands. All right, the next. So I want to kind of show or talk about a couple ideas. So a mixed-use dock, that's been done in several areas on this along in the state where we're using color to help delineate sections. So rather than saying, know this, know that, instead we've taken approaches um, with the landowners of saying, okay, in the green zone, here's this activity. And in this zone, here's this activity. And that way it's a positive way. It also provides a management tool to help the county and to also make users feel good about doing what they want to do in those areas. So I didn't have a really great picture showing some of that color delineation, but the image hopefully you're seeing that's on the left shows that little bit of kind of teal green bull rail. That's one of the mechanisms that we've used to help delineate areas for banking or fishing, um, as well as for boat docking, um, we've also used different colors of decking material. Um, it, it really depends on what the application is. And then we are pushing accessibility. Um, a lot of boating is exempt from what you would consider a standard uh, upland ADA requirement. And we've decided we're going to really push some limits. So this was a project um, that we did not that long ago where that gangway has a slope, regardless of lower high water or tide, um, the maximum slope is 8%. And it was a way to reduce barriers for people with mobility challenges. Um, it's a very flat, stable walking surface. There's plenty of room to have somebody carry kayaks as well as having somebody pass by them while they're carrying kayaks. So for the development with having that mixed use dock at this site, we would envision 
a an accessible gangway that has that passing zone. This is just an example. This is not reflected of the length, the size, but I wanted to kind of show just because we use some terms that may not be familiar to everybody. All right. And then this is um, an accessible dock. We worked with the with many representatives from disabled communities in creating a prototype non-motorized dock that um, worked for people who had either uh, right or left arm um, uh, limitations so that you can launch backwards or forwards. It allows you to center yourself over your boat so you can position your legs into it. Um, it's very stable. It's a pressure triggered channel. So it floats, it takes, has very little resistance in being able to move up and down the slot. And as you can see in the picture that's on the right, the gangway is coming down. It's flush connected. Um, it's friendly for service animals to be able to cross the different surfaces and treads. Um, and there's plenty of room for staging. So you have room to stage your boats, to use any adaptive equipment or mobility equipment and have room to maneuver yourself into position. Um, so I just wanted to kind of show a couple of these because these are um, some similar ideas that we're thinking about to enhance the non-motorized access at Lindley. And, um, and it would tie in very nicely with the dock that the port did to help create are really one of the first legs to a fantastic water trail. Uh, next slide. So this is just an informational meeting. We wanted to share some background because it has been a long time um, from that initial process. And we wanted to hear from you and this is not the last opportunity for it. So I think the next one, so I think at this point, we're going to open it up and we'll do that raised hand feature. But what I'm going to do once this meeting concludes is I'll send you guys an email with this smart sheet link since we don't have an ability to chat with each other right now. And the smart sheet allows you guys to write as much as you want and it comes right to me and then I can start sorting out all the different interests and comments on this plan C. But since we have you all here tonight, I, I think what makes sense most, Janine, is we flip back to the plan C slide. Is that okay? Yes. And then if you would like to comment or, again, we have a lot of experts in this room as people were coming in. We've got the engineers here. We have ODF and W here. Um, so perhaps we can start a dialogue. You know, no one wants to go first, but I'm kind of looking down the row here for any kind of hands. Good, I'm starting to see them. Okay, and I do want to add that this will be, we're going to do the same presentation at the in-person meeting. Um, so just want to make sure everybody knows that there, there will be the same process, but in person um, later on. Yeah, and for the in-person meeting, and I'll send this out in a follow-up email, but that's going to be next Thursday, March 16th at the Walport Coast and Fire at four o'clock, but it'll be the same slideshow. So I'm seeing a couple of hands and I think I'm gonna unmute Melissa first here. So Melissa. So Melissa, we can't hear you yet, but I've given you the option to unmute yourself. Melissa, if you want to talk, well, you can raise your hand again, but I have John French, so I'm going to ask him to unmute right now. Oh, thank you, uh, Kelly. Um, I had a hard time kind of visualizing things based on this black and white concept plan. So I, I don't know if you can see this, but I, I kind of outlined the wetlands and the development plan. And, and basically, 
the only open area. Can you see that? We can't, John, and I don't <laughs> think because you're not a co-presenter, okay. we don't have that as a feature, but if it's something that you think would be valuable for everyone to see, you're welcome to email it to me and I can- I'll, I'll, I'll do that, yeah. Okay. Uh, basically, the, the wetlands, which are, wetland A is a very thick growth of, uh, as you know, very thick growth of, of vegetation, and wetland B is riparian along the water. And those two areas um, are really, the, which, which are not open space, so the development will basically turn the only open space in, into a parking lot, as from what I can tell, which, which concerns me. OK, thanks for your comment. We'll take that into consideration. Does anyone else want to raise their hand? OK, Melissa, we're going to try it again. Okay, we can't hear you still, Melissa, but I'm going to go to another person and we'll keep getting back to you. <laughs> Hopefully we can get that tech figured out. But I have Jackie Wolf that I'm asking to unmute right now. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking with Melissa, what I had to do is the unmute option didn't show up until I brought my cursor onto the screen. So if she's not being able to find the unmute function, that might help. But I also wanted to mention that in the... Um, the schematics that were shown in the, the publicity, they were older than this one. And there was no, until this, um, this design, I did not see any non-motorized launch space, any dock. And everybody says, oh yes, there's a, a kayak dock. And I have been going out of that park for years. There is not a kayak launch. So it's nice to see this. Um, I understand what people are saying about the open space, but it seems that uh, this design may be preserving that beautiful area that is partially overhung by old trees and yet has a grass base. It's just a magical place. So I'd like to see maybe this overlaid with a, an aerial view so that it would bring it more into proportion for those of us who have used the park on the ground. Um, I, I can kind of read most of it. Um, I lived up there for from 2006 to 13 and then go up there constantly kayak because you don't have to worry as much about the tides. Even in the launch at the port, the tides and the currents can be really prohibitive. And going up river, it, even in, at low tide is much easier to, to launch a, a kayak or a human powered boat. So. That's just my input. Okay, thanks, Jackie. Sure. I've got Michael and Sally. Hello, this is Sally. Um, I was wondering, there are a lot of other boat ramps um, along the LC that are part of fish camps or that sort of thing where they allow uh, the public to actually launch for a fee. And I was wondering, um, what, what, how you're planning on having the public pay for this? Um, it, it, will it be like a charge for, for launching or a day use charge or what? We haven't gotten that far yet. I've been in reading the back history. It looked like this might be a pay park just to limit um, like a $5 charge, but we have boat ramps all over the county and we currently don't charge for any of those. So I think that's a future, <laughs> future ask, but there Thanks. are a lot of pay boat launch launches in this area. Janine, do you want to comment on that at all? Um, I think the operational aspect will be something that um, the county and ODFNW as a landowner would need to work out. Um, there's that reasonableness associated with fees. Um, so I don't really have anything else to add 
into that, but I do think it would be a, a further discussion. So we don't have a chat, but I guess we have this feature called question and answer. So Melissa, you are having some trouble with um, unmuting, but I see you've written in this section a little bit. So hours of operation for the park. Currently it's open dawn to dusk. Um, it is gated right now, but you're welcome to park at the gate and then go and trips around in the, the grass area that's kind of muddy right now. And in the summertime, we have a park host there that is um, just, available to answer questions. He lives out there and kind of keeps the security aspect of it under wraps. Um, will there be increased Marine Patrol, Melissa asks. Do we have anyone from Marine Patrol here? Or do you know, Janine? Um, I don't think there's anybody presence from that. As far as the where the Marine Patrol operates, um, a lot of that is decided through the sheriff's office on which water bodies at what times they're out there on the water. Um, and as far as no wakes and five mile an hour signs, there's no plan to do that. If a landowner wants to apply for one, there is a process to go through which they can apply to have to install one. Um, and so Melissa, you indicate you live next door. Um, are you upstream, downstream, across the river? We don't know on Melissa, because she's having okay. some tech issues, but perhaps she can even write in another question. Right now I see another hand, Irene Bailey. So I'm gonna click on you. Um, yeah, I was just curious as kind of this progresses, um, I think Jackie spoke to this, there's a really beautiful um, cedar tree there that I would say is much older than me and probably older than most people that will use the park and really beautiful. And just wondering how um, the kind of the trees that are there and these really spectacular trees that we can't replace in our lifetime um, will be preserved and how that is factored into the plans of the place. And it really is a place that people come to picnic and children walking around. And I've spent a lot of time there um, in the summers and the spring, just kind of enjoying the ambiance and just, yeah, curious how the other beings of that place will be factored in. I think that's something we're considering and that's why we're kind of opening up to the public process because it is a really magical place um, on the river. And um, I am a birder. And so I noted that immediately when I got there, there's a million different biodiversity birds that are going on in this little piece of land. And so that's something that we'll definitely be considering as we move forward with these plants. And I know what tree you're talking about. That is a cool little octopus type cedar tree. Um, Mike Gaddins. All right, Mike Gatons. Uh, what uh, the LC Sports, is, we all kind of had a little chat and wanted to make sure we brought, you know, I'm seeing the ADA doc, which was uh, something we wanted to have a really good discussion about, you know, something with uh, all the private lands up and down the river there. I grew up in, on the LC in the area and, you know, my dad's been a guide for 35 years as well on the river. So I know it very well on the tidal area and uh, all the private land and stuff, it, it just makes it hard for the folks with in a wheelchair, you know, to have any kind of, or just a fishing dock platform in general, you know, and just, I just wanted to express that those kind of things in the picnic areas, in the kayak launch, those are like needed more. And, and, then, and then I'll say into my opinion, than the boat launch you know there's much many but there's a lot other boat launches already riviera could could use an update in that area and make people access upper tidal area um and then the the, the rv parks and then the port of alc has you know we just paid with our tax dollars a big huge amount of money for the new new boat launch there so um we just wanted to make sure and, and i see that your ada access dock uh, and the 
fishing platform or people just to go out on and, and to enjoy bird watching or, or fish jumping, you know, it's super cool. Um, that's a really big need more the more so than I want to say, you know, open it up for just more people to come in and, and create more wakes, you know, uh, into a pristine area that, you know, it's kind of nice that it's kind of non accessible in a sense, you know, it gives that, uh, just uh that source of pristine you know what i'm saying yeah thanks mike for your comment and that's um something as parks i can speak on not just this park but every park we're trying to diversify so we can have access for all users and that ada thing just keeps coming up that we just don't have available right now within lincoln county parks access on the bank for fishing right and, and then our especially for wheelchair fishing exactly our association has been really involved in like up at mike bauer um we put in a platform so folks in wheelchair can actually wheelchair down on the upper river area and uh do some plunking and steelhead fishing or salmon fishing when they're running up river um so and to actually physically get to see that in use you know it's it's pretty heart touching when somebody with that disability is able to actually throw throw a cast out in the river and feel part of something you know it's 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 pretty huge you know so i just i want to really express that without a doubt we need a, a area where wheelchairs can access and it looks like it's in the plan and that's i'm really happy to see that because it saves a lot of you know bringing it up in the future so it's kind of what i wanted to add thanks for bringing that lens mike and and the trees too i mean i grew up on the river there and to see some of them trees go away would be really heart heartfelt so all right judith yes peace thank peace. you very much and thank you mike for saying all that um that makes me really happy you feel that way and want to preserve it um i'm something is confusing me here with this this conceptual plan that is now appearing it's not the one that's on the website. This one looks like a kind of a crude drawing that shows the trees that will, from what I understand, will no longer be there. So can we, that doesn't really represent what they're wanting to do in Plan C. Does that make sense? Janine, can you explain, should I toggle back to the other one? Yes, please. You see, there's no trees there. Right. And that's because to add the trees into this, you lose some of the detail. So we provided it as that shadow with the trees to, oh, to, yeah. to help you with both both perspectives on here. So if we start putting too much on one place, you start losing things and stuff that's running together. So we did this one so you can see the different topography and the um, design part. And then the shadow one, we included the trees. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. We've got Kevin. Oh, wait, wait. Hello? Okay, Judith, you want to say something else? Sure. Yeah, I, you know, Maureen Little is with me. She'd like to speak. To okay, something. Maureen? Yes, hello. This is Maureen. Um, I would just like to um, mention that there's really seven boat launches already on the All Sea from All Sea Bay all the way up to Don Lindley Park. And most of them are privately run boat launches. And if this boat launch comes in and it's um, free of charge or the fees are less, then we could be impacting those public businesses down the river. And also, there's very few um, there's very few access points on the All Sea River that aren't privately owned. So when a swimmer such as myself comes up river to go swimming, I can't find anywhere to swim. And then just two years ago, I found Don Linley Park, and I was so excited because there's a sandy beach there, and you can swim at high tide because the you know the water comes in and there's more water to swim in. But at low tide, most of the river is kind of shallow, and um, and I've seen fishing boats come up there, smaller boats, and they're all fishing right there where I'm swimming. And it's just great. It's very peaceful and relaxing. And then sometimes a huge boat will come through with some pleasure seekers on it or whatever. And 
they're causing a huge wake. And one time it shoved me right out of the river and onto the bank. The wake was so large. And the two little fishing boats that were there got shoved on the other side of the bank and they were just like frozen in place. They couldn't even move until this big boat swung itself around and went back down towards Alsi Bay. So I just wanted to say that um, it's such a beautiful, peaceful spot and we don't have, the public doesn't have much access to um, the Alsi Bay to do, I mean, to the Alsi River to go swimming or fishing off the banks, like I've seen a lot of fishermen doing that there and kayaking. Thank you. Thanks, Maureen. Thanks for sharing your story. All right, we got Kevin. You should still be able to talk. Yes, can you hear me? I can. Wonderful. Um, first, I just want to say thanks for the care and thoughtfulness that's being put into this and the chance to uh, you know, bring community input to it. Um, I, you know, I agree with so much of what has been said so far with the profusion of other boat launches along the uh, the Alsi. Um, it seems like there's many other ways that um, getting additional boats onto the river without disrupting the pretty unique nature of the park. Um, there might be other opportunities for, for example, upgrades to some of those other boat ramps and then perhaps licensing days on those private uh, boat ramps. It might actually save the county costs um, in the long run while preserving you know the nature of this park which is um, pretty amazing I uh, raft there and uh, paddle there and really enjoy going out there in a place that's quiet and really um, undisturbed in a way that I can't really get in other places the, the limited access to the public in the river in this way so um, and the trees are also beautiful there I'll second that as well so thank you very much thanks Kevin Okay, you guys, so, oh, I got another hand here. Kelly Fuller, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Hey there, yeah, Kelly Fuller from Oregon Wild. And this is, I echo what people have said, this is a great park. And um, while I'm here representing Oregon Wild, I've actually been to this park and I enjoy this park when I go to um, Wildport and it's a great place to wildlife watch. And um, the, Forested intertidal white wetlands there are really important for wildlife and it sounds like since um, plan B is off the table that there those are going to be all right. Um, and I really want to thank the county for clarifying what's going on. It's been a little confusing for a while to understand it and it's good to be clarified. But I want to talk about some other wildlife that I've been hearing about from people who are local. Um, people keep bringing up elk. And elk are important as a wildlife watching opportunity. And they're a kind of wildlife that people really do like to, to watch. And we've got a concern about Plan C. And I think it echoes here something that John said earlier, which is if a lot of that open area winds up getting turning into a parking lot, are the elk going to keep coming back to the park? And if they don't keep coming back, then that wildlife watching opportunity goes away. And elk really are a wildlife species that people love to watch and that's meaningful. And we really encourage the county to do everything it can to preserve the elk viewing opportunity. Um, and in addition, we'd like to draw attention to the fact that the National Marine Fishery Service is con currently considering whether to list Chinook salmon as threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act. And it points to the need to make certain that whatever facilities are developed at Don Lindley Park do not harm fish habitat, because we don't want to get the salmon into any more trouble than they're already in. And finally, I just want to note that as we've been talking to local people, it's really clear that whatever the original intent was, that Don Lindley Park has really become a community park and there are many different types of users. You know, people have been talking tonight about swimming, fishing from the banks, launching kayaks, wildlife watching, but we've also been hearing from people that are watching, walking their dogs, they're exercising, they're taking pictures, they're having picnics, and I'm sure there are many more uses that we haven't even heard from tonight. And so, we would really like to see the county that whatever it does to develop the park, 
that you please design it in a way that it doesn't displace the park's current users, both the human users and the wildlife users. Thank you, Kelly. I've got Cameron. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Um, so um, I made a point of um, getting hold of and reviewing most of the documents related to this park because it has uh, been uh, through quite a long journey up till this point, uh, as the initial presentation made clear. Uh, and it looks to me from, I looked at the original purchase document uh, by which the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife bought the property uh, and the 2015 lease between ODFW and the county for management of the property uh, and some other documents. And there isn't anything in any of those documents that requires the county to build any of the options that have been discussed tonight. I understand that the larger option is off the table because the permitting agencies don't wish there to be any um, harm to the wetland, but uh, there's also nothing in the existing documents that requires the county to develop this uh, conceptual plan C uh, or any other one, uh, it, in order for any planning to go ahead or any project to go ahead, Lincoln County has to uh, grant a conditional use permit for the project. And it looks to me from reviewing all the documents that the county is completely free uh, to hold an open parks planning and land use planning process or separate processes perhaps. Uh, one for parks planning to really uh, take the temperature of the community about the many uses that have been mentioned here tonight and others we haven't heard from about what the best use of the park would be. And then an open land use planning process on the conditional use permit for whatever the project comes up to be that the county wishes to implement. Um, I think the main point that I want to make is that the that Lincoln County is free to have an open uh, process. Things have changed in terms of what people wish the park to be and what uses it, um, it best serves from what was the case 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, that seems clear from listening to people's testimony. So we uh, at Oregon Coast Alliance, which is a land use uh, and natural resource protection organization, would urge the county to have an open um, process of parks planning and land use planning, since it does not seem that uh, any of the documents require the county to build uh, any of the project proposals that have been placed before it thus far. I hear you, Cameron. <laughs> That's something I've definitely been looking into because we've accepted a lot of money from different organizations. And just to reiterate, this isn't the county's land. It's Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife land. Um, and so they definitely would have a stake in this. They've kind of just said the county can be the caretakers in planning this. You're, you can go ahead and still speak, Cameron. I see your hand still up. Oh. Uh, yes, ODFW uh, owns the land, uh, but the county has a uh, um, memorandum of agreement with ODFW about that, uh, in which the county is the caretaker. However, in order to move ahead with any project, Lincoln County must grant a conditional use permit for it. And there's been uh, some uh, concern from people that perhaps one or another of these projects is already locked in. And I don't see that in any of the documents that I reviewed. Uh, some form of boating access seems to be required, uh, but what that could be could is completely left to uh, what designs come up and what would be the will of the community. Motorized boat access is not required from what I can see. Um, it could be uh, only non-motorized boat access. I think the main point is that the parties who purchased it, 
ODFW and uh, the parties who contributed money for the purchase, uh, along with the community, should really sit down knowing that the process can be open. There's no legal requirements that I can see as a non-lawyer looking at it that require the county to go this way or that way, but sit down in an open parks planning and then land use planning process uh, for a conceptual plan for the park that meets current community needs. Um, and uh, the, it's to me, it's good news that the county apparently has the uh, ability to enter into an open um, planning set of processes to take the will of the community. There's, there's nobody is locked into anything here. Uh, and there's a lot of community interest in this site that's clear from this meeting tonight. Uh, and I think that gives the county a really good opportunity to begin um, going ahead. Great, thank you, Cameron. We got Michael and Sally. Yes. Yes, yes this is Michael. I just like to reiterate um, what a lot of people have already said is that it's a great place. You know, you think about it when you drive up and down the, uh, the river, there are no places like this that are accessible and you don't have to pay for it. Um, it's a great place, like people were saying, birding. Um, you can fish off the bank. There's just a number of pluses versus the minuses. Also, I'm concerned about safety. Uh, people actually uh, entering or exiting the area. The speed limit is like 50 miles an hour. And you have those two other landings nearby. Um, I'm concerned about uh, you know, possible accidents. Um, also, I was wondering, are, is there a riprap involved with this? Because we've talked about erosion uh, with um, uh, people, you know, boats going by at a high speed and sort of tearing up the banks and whatnot. And I was wondering if uh, that is a possibility. Um, so, Janine, can you speak on the design aspect of whether there's riprap or not? Yeah. So, um, there's what we call edge protection around the boat ramp as for people to load and unload. We protect that. But along the bank, no, we want to keep it natural um, and do some restoration work along that bank line. All right, Deborah Fant, Fant. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm appreciating listening to everybody's comments. And I guess what I keep coming back to is the awareness from a climate disarray point of view that in a lot of conversations about the whole length of the river we're talking about needing to protect riparian zones to keep the water from being in direct sunlight and warming the water um, and in this area there are some beautiful trees that are part of that kind of you know keeping things cool along the bank and I would I would guess that the geology and hydrology in this land is important in terms of being the, the zone between the river and the wetlands. And if, if that becomes paved, you know, the, the lesson that we're learning is we watch cities heating up and becoming short on water is that there's no percolation of, of rainwater or snow water um, through the, asphalt or concrete and that sort of thing. And I really would be very happy to see some adaptive kinds of use things put into this place, but to leave it as it is. And one of the things that hasn't been mentioned is that this is a place where I've taken my grandchild and done some teaching about you know, the, what, who lives in the river? And we saw otters playing in the river um, and water birds and finding giant maple leaves to make art projects out of and, you know, helping her to understand the importance of these wild places. And in a way, it's like a landlocked area 
that is, you know, has boundaries of the water on one side and the highway on the other side, but it, it feels like you're in this safe cocoon down in there and you can see across the, the land. So if somebody's coming, you know that in advance, there's just so many reasons to leave it alone. And I in, encourage people to consider that as a realistic and responsible solution um, and putting a few things in place that will help people who have disabilities to utilize this area as well. Like a single sidewalk would not be catastrophic, um, but a parking lot is something entirely different. That's a traffic issue. And I think the fellow who was talking about, you know, getting boat trailers and, and trucks from the parking or the lower area to the highway and onto the highway. There's no left turn zone there. Um, I think that is a consideration that is important. So thanks for listening. Thank you, Deborah. I have Mike Gattens. I think you said your name was different, so Gattens. <laughs> Mike Gaddins? Oops, there sorry. So, they forgot to hit the mute button. So uh, I was just kind of pondering all of a sudden and thinking, what's the plan uh, about sort of policing in a sense, not, you know, extra parking spots. And then you get, you know, unfortunately the homeless population is, is pretty steep around the area. Uh, you know, I also work for the US Forest Service. So uh, we encounter that a lot out in the woods. And, you know, they get pushed out of the forest, which all these parking spots, you know, could encourage folks to kind of settle in there. And then with that, you know, what kind of a filtration for, in the parking lot is there going to be for the water, you know, collecting oils from the vehicles to go back into the river? Thanks, Mike. So regarding the security issue. This is a remote park and we know that there's a general malfeasance going on in the county with all our remote car parks. And one of the ways that we've dealt with that within the park with our limited funding and our limited staff is to have a volunteer park host on site um, in season at least that can keep us afloat on what's going on because we just don't have the staff to be out at all the parks and all the time. So we kind of augment that by having park hosts on there. Janine, could you speak to um, maybe the permeability or the bioswales or anything like that of the, the parking lot? Yeah, so um, with any project that we're involved in, stormwater management is a big component. So there will be treatment facilities. Those have not been determined yet on what that method of treatment is. Um, we've done some groundwater, uh, our ground table, looking at things and have information that we would be using to help um, obtain the DEQ permits for it. Thank you. Um, Judith? Hello, this is Maureen Little again. I just wanted to mention, someone talked about the traffic issues. Um, when I go to that to Don Lindley Park in the summer. And I have to make a left turn as I'm approaching from the west. And it's so close to the Tidewater Bridge that I can't see anyone, any vehicles coming over that bridge until they're at the very top of the bridge. So as I approach Don Lindley, I have to just turn like hell and get into the parking lot as fast as I can because um, someone is invariably is coming over that bridge and they're not expecting someone to be turning right there. So they're, they're coming pretty fast. And it's, I couldn't imagine a large truck with a boat trailer trying to make that sharp left turn into that parking area um, in a very short amount of time. Thank you. I've got Michael and Sally. Yes, um, I wanna, when my dog wants to address it too. Um, is it going to continue to be a day use area? I know someone was concerned about um, people, you know, homeless people or what taking up residence, but it's going to continue to be a um, 
gay use here, right? Well, I mean, we're really open at this point. I think in the park planning and community discussion, we'll kind of find out what do people want in this park? What, you know, what would be the best use of there? And, you know, in some of our parks, we have a small boat ramp and then we have just a few camping spots like Elk City Park. Um, so that might be a possibility too, in that we have some overnight tent spots. I'm not we're not sure yet. We're still in the planning process. And that's what we kind of want to hear is just have the community give us their feedback and give us your wants and your wishes. Right. And also, um, would it be open year round like it isn't at the present time? Yeah. So that has to do with seasonal flooding. And so why we close some of our parks um, off season is just because they're in the flood zone. Our park host would never be able to be there year round. And so I think right now we're closing the day gate just to curb the people coming in and maybe doing bad things without someone on site. And we can't have someone on site there year round because of the zoning of it and the flooding of it. So so the thing is, you're going to pave it and you can't leave it open all year long. Um, maybe you should just leave it the way it is. We, we hear that, that echo in a lot of people, but I have another hand. So let's hear from someone we haven't heard from okay. yet. Um, we've got Derek Wilson. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Derek Wilson, uh, work for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. In my former position, I worked with the county uh, to develop a lot of boat ramps in the mid coast, specifically in Lincoln County. And so kind of like the history was explained a bit here, but originally the idea was to look for public access, again, public access on this section of the LC River uh, to address the need for a lot of the boating and, and, and overall use of the waterway, uh, motorized, non-motorized, both. Um, ideally, this project was supposed to have been done years ago, but certain things happened that delayed it. Uh, overall impacts, as I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about, you know, we, we all agree with that. And so minimizing impacts, especially to the, the, the larger forested wetland is the, the idea. Uh, I also work on a lot of mitigation projects up and down the coast, so I'm well aware of all that. Uh, any trees or any different things that get uh, taken out. Uh, native vegetation does get put back in, so there's always that aspect. Um, traditionally, there hasn't been fees on Lincoln County Parks, uh, as Kelly said, and, and typically that's something ODFW supports as well. Um, someone brought up wake zones on the LC River through this section. There are several different zones that are legally no wake zones through the Oregon Marine Board. The section right here, I don't think is at the moment, but that could easily be put back into. And typically when you have dock structures and everything, you are legally not supposed to have a wake anyways. Um, there's been talk of other ramps in the area and that is correct downstream and, and, and one right just slightly upstream. These are all older boat facilities that are um, been kind of run down. They're not dredged out well. The, the docks and things uh, are old and crumbly and they can only facilitate so much use uh, from a safety concern. There's also lots of trucks and boats that park out on the highways on these locations. So uh, they do get busy uh, having a ramp up here may uh, distribute different uh, boating anglers up and down the river farther. So you don't have one area congested more than others. Um, for ODFW land, and as in with this park is technically ODFW land. We have several others that the county manages for us. There is no overnight camping or staying. It's day use only. And so that kind of alleviates the question there. It would be day use only. So you don't have people camping and staying out overnight and uh, issues with that. Uh, Janine brought up the question or someone asked about um, how you treat the water. Again, throughout permitting processes and whatnot, Anytime you put in type of impervious surfaces or whatnot, you legally have to put in bio swales. And there's been several different types that could be put in and used here. So that, that addresses any kind of uh, uh, water quality standards. And then what was the last one? Oh, I think other, you know, a lot of kayaking that's become a newer, bigger thing. And uh, I think it's great. 
Uh, the port of LC has several spots you can launch down there. You have Drift Creek, which is real close uh, that you can launch and go across up Drift Creek from uh, those private ramps as well. And then there's back access to Drift Creek uh, through a different road and as well as launching kayaks up at the upper end of Tidewater. So there's other options for kayakers in the area too. And maintaining a non or a kayak ramp here is, is really important to uh, overall use of this. Uh, and I think as Mike said, just ADA accessibility is, is definitely a plus. So I just wanted to touch on a couple of topics I heard people talking about and I'll uh, leave it at that for the moment. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Derek, for clarifying on some of that. So I don't see any more hands and we're at the five o'clock hour. It's not like this is timed or anything, but I do want to thank everyone for being considerate, having an open mind, coming at this community dialogue, which is what we're after. We want feedback and we're going to be looking at all the possibilities for this special little piece of land. Um, I'm going to flip back to here so you have mine and Janine's email, but really I'm going to be sending you an email right after we're done here with a smart link that you're welcome to type up any other concerns or just summarize your thoughts from this meeting. And um, we will be sure to keep you in the loop um, going forward. Janine, would you like any last words? No, I, I echo. Thank you very much. Um, this has been some great feedback and information. I really uh, appreciate the respectful tone and manner of doing this. Um, this is a, a great opportunity to hear things. And, um, you know, like Kelly has said, we'll have another meeting, we'll regroup. Um, but there's no decisions coming through this. This is simply informational. Thanks. I see one last hand for Judith. So if you, I'm going to ask you to mute. Hi, this is Maureen Little again. Can you hear me? We can. Yep. I just wanted um, a question for Derek um, from ODFW. Uh, I've talked to some of the Tidewater people and they said there's a lot of obstructions in the in the river along there from Don Lindley up into Tidewater. There's fallen trees under the water and there's boulders and that kind of thing. So some of the larger boats would have trouble getting through there. I'm wondering if Derek and his crowd plans to um, dredge the river at that point because I certainly wouldn't want it to disturb the salmon that are have their habitats up there along those fragile banks. Oh, okay, thank you. Good question. Yes, uh, no, absolutely no dredging at all. We don't support any of that type of stuff. Uh, there are no big obstacles for boats getting up the river through there, no matter how large. Occasionally you get a tree or two that comes down or different things and, and because it's a navigable waterway, uh, if a tree crosses the river or it's a navigational hazard, uh, that can be removed to a degree. Typically the Marine Patrol will come out and cut a chunk like that. There's no big boulders per se that's in the way of, of anything. Uh, the tide rises in low, you know, up and down. So you have to, as a boater, you have to just pay attention to what, you know, where the depths and whatnot are. But um, no, habitat is a uh, priority and um, wouldn't do any other kind of dredging or anything like that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Michael and Sally. This is Sally. Um, I thank you guys for all of, of uh, putting this on so that we can actually see what's going on uh, a little more. Um, and thank you very much to Oregon Wild for letting us know that this was actually happening. Um, what I would like to offer is maybe we, uh, you could make the uh, advertising this a little more so you might have some more participation. And that's all I'm asking. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Noted. All right. With that, you guys, I think we're going to say adios for tonight. Um, but it was a pleasure. And I thank you for caring about your parks and um, coming to this today. Um, our next meeting is March 16th. It'll be the same slideshow. It's just another way for people to start commenting on this. 
And once we sign off and close this, I will post this meeting online as well for anyone to listen in so that everyone can get the info. And um, again, I'll send out that link with the Smartsheet after this.